Hello there, Internet peeps. It's your good buddy, Rue, and I'm finally going to start reading my way out of my comic book fort. Um, as many of you know, I've had to slightly, severely diminish, at first I said stop, but I can't do that, um, the amount of trades I buy because I have just too many to read through. Um, I have way too many trades that are unread, and it just became stupid to add more to that pile at the rate I was doing it. Um, I've hit a good groove. I've started reading comics at work during my breaks. Um, I don't really have any friends. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to show you the, a bit of my first dent in this. And um, I'm going to go in my normal order of most disappointing to awesome. And so this way you have a reason to stay to the end. Fairest Volume 1 Wide Awake. No, no. Um, this was just a boring, pointless, mundane waste of time. There's seven issues in here, two s full stories, I guess, and only one of them would have been worth the price of that comic book. Um, to say something positive about this, Ferris does tend to fill in, I guess, plot points of Fables, but so far the two plot points I've discovered are only plot points that have come up since Ferris has been published, and so it... It's a circular logic as the existence of this book. The first six issues is one story, and if you think Bendis rambles on too much in comics, just skip that entire arc, because it was one big conversation. Um, the second story actually is really kind of cool. Um, it, it's the one that's, the book, issue seven, is the one I was saying that I actually probably would have bought. It tells a nice tale of um, Beauty and the Beast shedding, <laughs> shedding, um, some light on a mystery we didn't know existed about beauty's past but it was a really good story like I, I, i'm okay with this being canon because it's told well but there's really no need for it to exist but it's really cool it's set kind of in a like 1920s noir deco i don't know words that mean things like that so i hope that is right um but this is not overall i would not buy this again i'm not even gonna look at volume two unless i hear great things the best thing about this book though and I'm sorry if this makes me come off as kind of weird and one of those people. The cover to issue three, right there, that's one of the most beautiful things that came out in 2012. Um, and if it didn't make me look crappy or creepy, well, and crappy, I'd blow it up into a poster. But that would be kind of weird. Um, Star Wars, Dawn of the Jedi, Force Storm, um, what the bloody hell? I have no idea what happened in this book. Um, this was advertised as a book to tell the tale from the, of the beginning of the Jedi Order. And for a book to advertise itself like that, you sure did start in the middle. Um, this confused me. This raised more questions than it answered. And that for a prequel is not a good start. Um, for something that's supposed to tell the origin of something, raising too many questions at the beginning, I think it just put me off. Um... Instead of before the Jedi, before the Sith, before the light, before the dark, before lightsabers, we got all of those things with no real explanation of where they came from. Um, I really was hoping this would be about somehow people discovering the Force. Not from the beginning, like after people have discovered it and what to do with it, where the philosophies came from. Um, it's John Ostrander, though, and Legacy ended up rocking. So I'll give this one a look from the library, but I have no faith that I'll buy Volume 2. New Dead Wardians. Um, I stated in a previous episode, which will be linked up in the U YouTube spot and um, have a link in the text version at The Outhousers, the greatest comic book website in all of space and time, um, that New Dead Wardians was the only Vertigo book of 2012 in that wave that came out with uh, Ferris, Saucer Country, and Voodoo Child that I felt even at the time was good. I, I bought Ferris out of loyalty to Fables. Um, and I, I was right. D Dan Abnett of uh, Abnett Lanning, Nova, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Resurrection. You know who I'm talking about, so stop being like that. Um, period piece, Victorian England. I guess those are the right terms. Again, I don't know. I really don't know English periods. I, I kind of learned that in high school and forgot it after the test. Um, a murder mystery set then... Um, Basically a murder of uh, Immortal. They, um, this is a world that's beset by zombies and vampires, even though they, they're not called that, where that's not the point, but it's the plot device that gets you to basically wonder how 
a being who's not supposed to be able to die is murdered. Um, the overall tale isn't really about who did it, but how they did it and when. And like, it really does. Ex the overall murder tale ends up telling the story of the world they live in. Um, but behind all of that, the murder mystery, which is a good mystery, it's a good story, it's a good setting, it, they sell it very well. But behind all of that is this main character who is so beset by these feelings of ennui due to his immortality, and the how this that his character growth, and again, this is a character who doesn't feel that he has any growth left if, in him, over the over this these few books, this mini series, just him being able to find discover that he can learn, can live, even though he's dead. Um, it was actually just a damn good story on that alone. You don't need to read the new Edwardians, but you should want to. The book you need to be reading, The Sixth Gun. This is volume four, a town called Penance. Um, excuse me. I keep harping on The Sixth Gun. I think this might be a bit... At least the fourth, maybe the fifth time I've showcased this in one of the reviews... I try not to do that. I skip over trades. I skip over single issues. But for a book this good, it's so hard to just gloss over when I was just so excited when I was done. It was like, I, I want to talk about this comic book. Um, I'm not going to sell you on the series again. If you're not reading this, it's because you dislike yourself as a person, and I don't have the expertise to talk you through that. Um, but inside this collection, which is 18 through 23, is issue 21. And it is a silent issue. And those are always the ones that are the hardest, in my opinion, to pull off. Because, again, as someone who doesn't really get or know or recognize art, um, I need issues like this to show me how really difficult it is to tell a good story with no words. Um, this might be the best silent issue since, and I've read it in trade. I, I didn't read it when I was six, five. 1984's uh, G.I. Joe. Um, the Silent Interlude, I think. That's 21 as well. Um, holy crap, that's 1984. I'm old. Um, Harry Potter turns 15 this year. I'm old. Um, this is an example of how to do that. Uh, Colin Bunn gets a lot of credit for the writing here, but again, this, this single issue showcases the skill Brian Hurt has in telling a story from an artist's point of view. And again, I've al I've always admitted how I'm not good with artists. Um, this was a very impressive. And I, it, it made sense even storyline-wise why nobody was talking. Well, why we didn't hear anything. Um, it's not that they weren't talking. It's that the reader couldn't hear it. Um, great, great comic book. And I don't know why you're not reading this. Do you are, you... are you so hipster that you need to ignore the awesome things? Whatever. Buy... The Sixth Gun, read it, and you'll be a better person. Demo. Um, Brian Wood, I, 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 base, I am a fanboy for Brian Wood. I'm not even going to deny it. Northlanders DMZ. I, I like the X-Men run. Um, I need to start picking up Conan. Brian Wood has never disappointed me, and I've gone out, and I'm actually now seeking out works of his that I've never read. Um, this And this is a collaboration. This is a 12-issue Vertigo miniseries from a while back um, with Becky... Becky Cloonan, and it is, it's no exception. It's just an incredibly awesome. Demo is a black and white series of 12 comics. Uh, each stand alone, about, but the same stories, young, confused, sad, happy, conflict. It, it tells a story of what it's like to be in your 20s, and yes, some of these kids are teenagers, but, the, but I'm sorry, this, to me, felt like me in the 20s, which is honestly, in my 20s, not the 20s, um, wh why this is such a good book. Um, some of the kids have superpowers, some, but most of them don't, but it's not about that. This isn't t tights, capes, whatever. It is really just a story about being stupid and the consequences of that and actually being happy with the mistakes you made because it's the only way you can grow. I'm being way too deep about this, but that's what this book is. Um, I do wish I read it in my 20s, but that's not necessary. I've said it, I think, five times now, even just today. I don't talk about art much, but throughout reading this, Becky Cloonan just impressed the hell out of me. Um, this, She just has this ability that I don't see, I don't even know if I've ever seen it, to change her style to fit the story, but it's definitely still hers. Um, I saw Frank Miller, uh, manga, anime, and just like 
this beautiful um, ish, uh, chapter four, which is this beautiful, simple black and white. There wasn't a style there, which I guess is a style in its own, but whatever. Um, I just the stories again were great. Brian Wood, fantastic writer, but nothing. But it would not have have been as emotional without this specific artist, and it's rare that I can see that. Um, by the end of this, I really think that she could have made Scout, um, I Kill Giants, or even a My Little Pony book hers. It would have not. It would have. They would have been the cartoony, serious, um, anime things that they needed to be. But she could have done it in a style that you just would have been able to look at it and go, "Yo, that's Becky." Um, I can't even color inside the lines. And when people can do things like that, I'm just impressed beyond belief. Elephant men, um, wounded animals. We've all been there in the comic book shop. You're looking around, you walk either past the trade shelves or even looking at the floppies, and you see that thing that's like, that looks interesting, but I need the new Flash. I need the new X-Men. The, the event has started. I'll get to that later. And you either keep waiting and waiting and waiting until you either forget to buy it, blow it off, or you, you, you go on a manic spending spree, spend full price on it, and get home and have your wife yell at you for spending too much money. Shut up! Um, either way... Elephant Man was, has been this book for me for years. Um, I just kept seeing it and seeing it. And finally one day, um, I was at the store, and I've talked before about how much I hate paying full price. Um, I use the DCBS, the Amazons. But I was like, no, I, if I don't buy it now, I never will. And holy crap, did I make a good decision. Um, this is worth missing. <laughs> Shh, don't tell her. This is worth making her mad at me that day. Um... Elephant Man, again, giving you a brief rundown, is a story of, and this is hard to explain, genetically engineered giant upright animals with, I guess, the capacity to learn like a human does, um, but were built for, um, the only purpose they were actually created was to be warriors, to rage war. The war is over, the dystopian future is destroyed, everything's crap, the elephant men are free and have equal rights. This is the book of what do they do next? Um, do, can they live in the real world? Can they should they live together? Can they coexist when giant hippos and giant crocod alligators, crocodiles, when giant hippos and giant crocodiles would be still would still be natural en en enemies based solely on nature alone? Um, I love this book. Um, Starkings obviously has a plan. And you you can see you can see the outline. This is right now the base of a tree, and it's very wide. Issue volume one was, and I'm hoping and I know. Future issues have to bring all this. Future volumes bring all this together, and I I, I can't wait. Um, with guest writers, guest artists, you still could see Starking in the background saying, "This is what I need you to do," um, and Joe Kelly, Chris Balaco. Brian Boland, Scott Campbell, and David Hine are just, like, they're in here. Um, it's it's like the first volume of Sandman, with the first couple of volumes of Sandman with all those new artists, those great artists, or the first couple of volumes of Spawn, where it's not just McFarlane, but it's also Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman. That's what's going on here. You know that the, the creators of Spawn, McFarlane, and, and Sandman Gaiman, had the overall, but they trusted these people to guest write it, and it was well worth it. Um, I really, I, I need the next book now, and the simplicity of this story is breathtaking in how deep it is. I say this all the time: there is no excuse with books like Elephant Men, Demo, or even The Sixth God. There's no excuse for this constant barrage of whining I hear that there's no good comics out there. Stop being lazy. Stop being a hater stop just buying books you just like out of habit and look for the new crap look for the interesting things yeah fine mainstream book like dmz got me into brian wood and i guess vertigo is still mainstream i don't know but trust your gut if you, something looks interesting pick it up try a single issue pick up a tray do amazon don't spend too much money go to the library do whatever you need to do but stop Stop whining there's nothing out there. Um, that took a long time, and that's not even all the trades I've read in the past two weeks. Um, until the next time, later, peeps.